Hi, friends. This is John. Welcome to the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast. Today, I'm here with Dave Fisher from Indiana. Dave is someone who uh, I've heard quite a bit about his work with his farming operation and also with the marketing work that they've been able to do and connecting directly with consumers for the products that they're producing. And, you know, this is such a foundational piece. I think it's important for us. If we want to be really successful as farmers, then there is a certain level to which we need to decommoditize ourselves, that we need to decommoditize our operations. I think this is a fundamental aspect of being particularly successful as individual farm operators. So, Dave, thank you for being here. Thanks for being willing to share your wisdom and experience Can you offer some context for our listeners of the history, your personal story, and the scope of your farming operation and and everything that you have going on? Sure, I'd be happy to. First of all, you know, thanks so much for having me on. Uh, I feel like I know you because I've listened to, I think, pretty well every podcast uh, you've ever created. So, you know, first of all, I really appreciate those podcasts and, you know, other people, the Rick Clark's podcast, you know, Gabe Brown's webinars and so forth. Those have been so helpful for me to just really understand more what's going on. So, you know, I'm happy to, to share the little bit of knowledge that uh, we've kind of uh, gained over the years and, and, and just tell our experience. So I'll start off with kind of explaining what we do. So we have really two separate businesses. We have a farm that is a cattle farm. That's all we produce. We don't sell any grain, don't sell any other livestock off of our farm. We own about 750 acres, but we either rent or custom graze for, or other people custom graze for us, about another 1,000 acres, somewhere in that range. So that's kind of our, our farming operation. And we do it all the way from cow calf, so we got over 500 mama cows, uh, all the way to finish. We finish around 1,000 to 1,200 calves a year as well. So uh, that's the farm business, and that's really kind of my day-to-day. I really manage that area. And then we also started 20 years ago selling direct. So we sell all of our beef direct to every single animal we've produced here over the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Uh, we sell through our meat business. Uh, our meat business, like I said, we started with our partners, a local processor, uh, Sander Processing. They, uh, it, it just really worked out well that they opened up a new facility in 2003 that was 10 miles from our house. We started our business in 2004, so it just really worked well and made a lot of sense. We kind of grew up with them. When they started, they had five employees. I think almost every single one was a family member. But now they're, I'd say they're probably 50 employees, something like that, across two, uh, two sites. So that meat business, we sell directly to mostly restaurants, uh, universities, that area. We do sell some direct, but 95-plus uh, percent of our business is selling to the, the restaurants, universities, microbreweries, those kind of things. So we sell our beef through that uh, business, but we also sell our neighbor's pork. We sell a lot of Amish produce and Amish uh, maple syrup, eggs, and so forth from the local community uh, that I've really enjoyed working with over the years. And so on the meat business, my wife really runs that operation. She does a great job of filling all our customer orders. We fill about 200 orders with an average of about five line items per order uh, every week. We produce every week. We haven't missed a week since we started back in uh, 2000, actually since We went to weekly, which was in 2006, and so she really manages that, does a great job with that. She's got a background as a nurse and actually nursing instructor. She's really good with the attention to detail that it takes to to make sure the customers, you know, get their orders on time. And then also my son, my oldest son, Joseph, uh, rejoined in the business five years ago, and he's our sales manager. Uh, He lives in Indianapolis, where a lot of our customers are. Uh, I, I should have mentioned we're down in southern Indiana. We're about two and a half hours south of Indianapolis. We're only about 30 minutes from the uh, Kentucky line. And uh, a lot of people think of agriculture in Indiana as the flat corn and soybeans fields of uh, central and northern <laughs> Indiana. Only if they've not been to southern Indiana. Exactly. And I would say it's beautiful to look at these hills that I'm looking out my window at, but a little bit more difficult to farm, in my opinion. But uh, works good for a cattle farm, uh, not as good on crops. But you know, we do have, I would say, where the hills kind of flatten out on top, that's where our crop fields are at. Right. And we have about 300 acres or so on our, on our farm of, uh, you know, what people would consider your, your you know, typical crops. 
and I'll get more in details of what exactly we're doing with with those. I do want to dive a bit more into the into the farming operation, but uh, you've given us a, a great intro and a great background to your meat processing and meat distribution specifically. What is your primary sales channels? Is, is it online sales? You going? Uh, is it in the local region? Um, you said you have 200 orders coming in or shipping 200 orders per week. Is it direct to consumers, restaurants? What does your distribution chain look like? Our direct to consumer, we do that off of our website. And also we have a lot of information on our website. Uh, so I probably should go ahead and tell folks that if they're sitting there. Uh, it's Fisher Farms with a C, so F-I-S-C-H-E-R, Farms, I N for indiana.com. So check that out. Uh, but we've got a lot of our regenerative ag practices on there. But So people can go to that website and order. Uh, again, it's not our primary business. It's probably only 3 4% of our sales. Uh, we get about 40 orders a week, but again, it's lower volume. So our, our primary business, uh, I'd say our number one customer is Indiana University. They've been a customer of ours since like 2007, somewhere in that range. Uh, but they started using us for all of their dorm proteins about ooh, seven or eight years ago, something like that. And so, uh, you know, they've got 9,000 freshmen uh, walking in the door into their dorms uh, every August. So uh, they eat a lot of burger and, and a lot of other items. So they've been a great customer, been great to work with. We host numerous classes that come down to our farm and so forth. So that's a big part of our business. But uh, and then we also sell to like Butler University, Wabash College, and you know, quite a few. I'm probably missing about four or five universities. Uh, but then we also sell to microbreweries. We've got a few kind of microbrewery chains. And to me, the classic example is if you go into a local brewery and you're buying a local beer, well, you want a local burger to go with it. You know? And so these microbreweries have really been good for us, as well as we just sell to a lot of restaurants, anywhere from the the chef-owned restaurants to ones that have like four or five or six uh, restaurants, you know, kind of the micro chains, never to, we, we don't sell to any of the bigger chains, obviously the volumes and uh, the cost would be prohibitive to us. That's really our market. We like that approach in that it's very repetitive. Uh, you know, we can butcher, you know, right now I, I should set this up front, we're butchering about 40 beef a week, something like that, and also about 80 to 90 hogs a week. Uh, all the hogs come from a, a neighbor of ours. They all come from one farm. They do a really good job on, the, on producing really good quality pork in a, in a natural manner. So yeah, that, that's a big part of our business. Uh, you know, basically, we're taking orders every Monday. It slips into Tuesday and Wednesday and so forth, and then we're cutting to order every week. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I should have mentioned that my background, so first of all, when I got out of uh, high school, I'll date myself here, but uh, in the mid-1980s. And, uh, you know, that was the farm aid time period when uh, things weren't going well in agriculture. And I knew that I really liked production. You know, I was really big into the farm all through grade school, high school, and so forth, and, and even through college. And I really figured out that I liked producing things. So I went to, to school, went to Purdue for industrial engineering, I uh, got my master's in it, and then I worked for a couple of aluminum companies starting off. Uh, there's some local aluminum companies that I worked for. And then I got into really more of the simulation modeling of the plants and really enjoyed that. And then a supply chain company that I worked with uh, hired me to be a supply chain consultant uh, with software. And I did that uh, for about 10 years then uh, working for them. Uh, led me to into a lot of really good companies to really understand their process for and really planning. I wasn't as much you know factory floor type stuff, but really more planning the operations, dealing with orders coming in, forecast, and so forth. Uh, it actually led us to live in Germany for two years uh, to work with Siemens over there, and just you know really learned a lot from Siemens as as well as just fascinating to live in another culture. So uh, you know learned a lot with that. In uh, 2002, I said I pretty well had enough of this. Uh, I, I should actually tell the story. Obviously, with consulting, you're doing a lot of traveling. So one week, I was lucky enough to get home Friday evening in time for the family dinner. And uh, my wife looks around the table and says, you know, what should we do this weekend? And my uh, two-and-a-half-year-old son, who's now part of the company, stood up on his chair and said, I know, Daddy, you can sleep at our house. So that really hit me hard. He didn't even think that I lived there anymore or, or you know, it wasn't my house anymore. So uh, 
we uh, stopped the traveling about a month later, and uh, it's worked well. Wow, that's a pretty hard-hitting story when you stopped and traveled. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's left an impression on me, that, that's for sure. So, you know, I, like I said, in supply chain, one thing we really worked with our customers on was reducing inventories and minimizing inventories. G generally, inventories are you know, basically for lack of information, you have to have inventory. And so we've really worked on reducing our inventory and making it as fresh as possible. So again, our general approach is we take orders on Monday. Uh, I'll simplify things a little bit. We take orders on Monday. We start processing all the animals, including the beef that has been dry aged for 14 to 17 days before that. Uh, the pork is killed that week. You know, you want pork fresh as possible. You want beef with that nice dry age on it. So we're starting to, you know, pulling those out of the cooler. We start processing on Monday and uh, just working to fill all those orders. Again, we've got a computer system that uh, we wrote to, you know, really handle all this complexity as, in, as simply as we can. We've got like 2,100 different SKUs, so different wow. individual products. But, you know, if you go across it, you know, it's a uh, difference is a four ounce fillet versus a six ounce fillet versus okay, got eight it. ounce fillet. You know, all those, each one's an individual skew. But still, still a lot of complexity. It is. But, you know, if you kind of boil it down to the, the nice thing is that each restaurant usually orders about 10 different items. You know, and, you know, we, our sales team, again, led by my son, really works with them to understand what they're, you know, what they've used before, what they're interested in. Is there a special cut that we can do for you and so forth? And then every week, it's just, okay, how much quantity do you want of each of those items? And so, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of how we work. Uh, the nice thing is it's very fresh. Uh, we butcher the hogs on Monday, start processing those on Tuesday. A lot of the times, they'll be to our customer already on Wednesday. Wow. Uh, very, very fresh pork. And uh, cryovac, so, so we get a really nice long shelf life with it. Wow, I was about to ask that question. What does the what does the delivery time if you begin processing beef on Monday? What does the delivery time look like for the beef as well? So yeah, on the beef, we'll start processing that on Monday. Some of it actually goes out the door late Monday afternoon, and our customers are getting it on Tuesday. But I, I would say the bulk of it goes out on uh, on a local delivery truck on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They pick up around noon from us. We've actually worked with a company out of Indianapolis, Piazza Produce. Now since uh, 2008, and uh, what they do, you know, they're delivering produce to a large percentage of the restaurants, uh, you know, across Indiana. Uh, even if you, you know, a restaurant uses Cisco or U.S. Foods for their meat and for other items, they might use Piazza Produce for their produce. So they've got a really wide distribution network, 150 trucks that go out every day. And so what they do, they're down in our area delivering produce uh, to local restaurants, when they're done, which is again about noon, one o'clock, they stop in, pick up our meat, take it back to their warehouse in Indianapolis, and then that gets divided out on the different routes. You know, each box we put a nice label on it that says what route this goes on. They divide that out to the different routes, and then their trucks start heading out. I think as early as like two o'clock in the morning, you know, to go to Cincinnati and so forth. You know, sometimes it's a really small world. I I seem to vaguely recall, isn't Piazza Produce the family business that Anthony Carsaro was from that I interviewed here on the podcast? I think it might be. Oh, yes. 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 Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. yeah. yeah it is. So what is the, when you have this particularly fresh meat delivery, is freshness an appeal factor at all for the restaurants and the people that you're supplying? Yes, very much so. I feel like they really lump it into quality. So we did a survey of our customers uh, just last year and said, you know, why are you buying from us? Which is, is kind of a tricky question to ask sometimes. But uh, the response we got back was, number one is quality. You know, you've got to have good quality. And, and uh, I'll go on a tangent here, but when I worked in the software business, quality was everything. And, and if you look at it, their variable cost of producing one more copy of their software is pennies. Right. You know, back then it was the three and a half inch floppy disk. So if you're not top quality, you really struggle. Then all you're doing is competing on price. And as you had mentioned earlier, when we got into this, I did not want to be selling a commodity. I'm not out there trying to be the lowest cost producer, especially in our hills and so forth. You know, I looked at it and said, you know, I'm never going to be able to compete in the long run with people that have 300 bushel an acre corn. So 
we looked at it and said, you know, what can we produce well? And it's obviously beef, and we can produce some really good quality beef to where we don't have to take the commodity price for it. I hear conversations from ranchers and farmers who are interested in producing grass-fed beef. They're very interested in, in decommoditizing themselves, but there's this recurring conversation that they have a very difficult time generating sales. They are already busy farming, and then they're taking classes on how to build a website and develop email marketing and do all these various things, which if that is not a skill set that you're familiar with and you're already very busy doing other things, that is just another level of frustration. So how did you approach developing sales? You, you have some very nice sales volume built up. And what was your approach to developing that and to building that initial sales pipeline? We started probably like everybody else does, going to farmer's markets. And uh, I, I always said farmer's markets are a good marketing activity. They're not so good on a sales activity. And I, I really differentiate those two. Is marketing is just getting your name out there. We're sales, obviously, getting the actual sale. So, you know, we'd go to the farmer's markets. We're dragging our young kids with us every Saturday, Wednesday afternoon, and so forth. We'd go to a few different farmer's markets. And, again, that was good to get our name out, but also to get a lot of good feedback. And so I, I really encourage farmers who are thinking about getting in this business, that's a really good way to start because you've got to meet your customer. You know, that's one thing in agriculture. You know, how many people in agriculture actually get to meet their customer? You know, if you're producing commodity, and, and I should say the end customer, not the person you sell your grain or your livestock to, but the person that really consumes it. So with farmers markets, you can do that. You can find out what people are interested in. And so, you know, we did that, but we also decided early on that, you know, farmers markets was not going to make our business. Uh, we're not real close to high population areas. Like I said, we're two and a half hours south of Indianapolis. So trying to make a living going up to Indianapolis, selling at farmers markets, you know, and even in Bloomington, which is uh, almost two hours from us, just you know, really difficult to do. So we decided early on that we were going to try to uh, tap into the restaurant business. So uh, I took my daughter. Uh, I don't know. She was maybe 9 or 10 at the time. And I went and knocked on 17 restaurant doors uh, one morning, and uh, I got one yes. <laughs> and I, that chef still buys from us, and I still tease him a lot. and said, you know, if you hadn't said yes, I'd be doing something very different right now. But uh, anyway, she's been a great friend and just a great chef. And, and he was one of those guys early on that, yeah, he wanted quality, but he was more interested in buying local. And so... And then he introduced me to some other chef friends of his, mostly in, in Indianapolis. The, the 17 door uh, example was in Bloomington. But he introduced me to a lot of good chefs up in Indianapolis. So what worked out well is I was able to, you know, kind of go end to end on the supply chain. And so, you know, I'm, I'm picking the genetics, I'm picking my bulls, picking my heifers and so forth. And then I'm going to, and, you know, raising them and developing, you know, the feed system and so forth. And then selecting the animals, which is a critical part of it, driving them to the butcher shop. They get butchered. And early on, I, I remember I would take pictures and videos of the group of cattle that I was going to take in, just so I would remember two weeks later, after they were dry aged, what each animal you know, looked like on the hoof and you know, its history and so forth that, that, that I had in my head. And so then. You know, we're butchering the animals. I'm actually the one sorting all the steaks. You know, the high-end steaks is really where you can identify the quality and, and where you've got, you know, the good animals. And from that then, I, you know, we, my wife and I and kids at the time, we would box up the meat, and I would go deliver it to the restaurant. And, you know, the restaurateur would then look at the meat, and he would tell me about last week's meat. He'd tell me about, you know, what this meat looked like and, you know, what was quality to them. And, you know, one interesting story I always talk about is that, you know, the one chef told me that our ribeyes weren't cut even enough. You know, I kind of looked at it, and it was like three-quarters of an inch on one side and an inch and a quarter on the other, just kind of the way that animal and the, and the processor cut it. And I didn't realize, but to him, that's a major issue. You know, if somebody wants a medium-rare steak and you've got that unevenness, it's not quality. You know, even though it's well-marbled, really flavorful tenderness, it's still not quality because you didn't cut it right. So all that feedback, you know, packaging, all those kind of things, just great feedback for those first, you know, probably five or six years when I was doing that. You know, I started off, uh, I was like, say, our first delivery truck was my little blue Prius. And 
you know, we used that, and there's two coolers in the back, ice down, and I could go deliver. And then uh, we graduated to uh, the family Suburban. So uh, that was my delivery truck where we would pack the boxes in the back. Uh, one interesting thing is the width of our box was decided because I could get four of those boxes into the back of the Suburban. So, and we still use those same boxes today. But then we would put ice blankets down on top of them and I'd go off and do my deliveries. So then we got into a refrigerated truck, that a unit that fit on the back of a pickup. Went off and did that until uh, one day I was driving up to Indianapolis and I looked out my rear view window or my mirror on the side and I could see smoke rolling out the back. Still joked that I was smoking the meat as I was delivering it. Uh, so anyways, I had to get rid of that truck and then we got a regular like 20 foot box delivery truck that, that we used and that I delivered with. Uh, and that was great. Uh, just about 2008 or so, we got to be where it was 16-hour days doing the deliveries and talking to chefs all the way and so forth. And that's when uh, Piazza approached us and said, you know, hey, wh why don't you let us do the delivery? But that early time period was really crucial for us to really understand what quality was. You know, I really messed around with a lot of different breeds. You know, I've had so many people early on tell me, once you take the height off an animal, you can't tell what breed it is. And that's very far from the truth, <laughs> uh, both the breed. And then it's, it's even within breeds, there's such a variation. Uh, you know, everybody wants Angus, and we do primarily use Angus genetics. But you've got to look within Angus. You know, the EPDs on the bulls and on the, on the mama cows as well is really critical. And so we have really tried to fine-tune that over the years to, to pull the right genetics. And we do some crossbreeding. We do use a shorthorn as a, as a crossbreed. But... Again, shorthorn varies tremendously, and there's actually kind of, it's a mixture of different breeds. But we work with one breeder, uh, Wakaru Shorthorn up in Rensselaer, Indiana. And I really feel like they're the best shorthorn breeder in the world. They send their semen all over the, the world. And they've identified via DNA the top 20% for marbling. And that top 20% pool is what I then pull from for, for those bulls that, that we use in cross. And then we do a lot of AI work, and, and my favorite bull is a half shorthorn, half Angus bull that we then match up against cows that are, again, somewhere around that half to 75% Angus. We, we, we lean a little bit more Angus than we do shorthorn uh, just to get the quality that we're looking for. My goodness, Dave, there's about half a dozen questions that I want to ask. It would be fascinating to get into more into the conversation of cattle genetics, but you haven't really mentioned how quality or how the quantity, how much quantity of beef you were delivering in the early days versus what you are now. I imagine it's grown very significantly. And you spoke about how uh, those, those early years of having regular conversations and personal relationships with your customers really helped develop an appreciation for quality. How easy has it been for you to maintain quality as you have grown? I would say our quality has consistently improved. That's interesting. And we're not, interesting. Yeah, we're still not to the point where I want to be on quality. Uh, you know, every steak I want to have what we call prime plus, so it's got better marbling than prime, and that it's also very tender and flavorful. You know, everybody just looks at marbling, but there's also the tenderness aspect to it. And so we really have worked to improve our genetics, and now as we've grown to improve our cooperative herd genetics, to where we're getting better and better quality. I just got to share that yesterday we got a text from a butcher shop that we supply, and he took two of the ribeyes home to have for his family meal, and uh, he immediately texted us and said these are the best steaks that he's eaten in his life. <laughs> and that just, you know, to me, that's what I want to hear every time. You know, it, it's just that quality is just, it, you know, it what allows you to charge more than the commodity price. And so you just got to really focus on that quality as you're going out. And, and like I said, quality is all decided by the customer. You know, I, I can't say what's good quality. They tell you what's good quality. Well, now I want to ask you about pricing. And I also want to ask you about quality and particularly flavorful. You mentioned being flavorful and being tender. Right. How do you produce that? What's the, there's the genetic component, but what are the what are the various contributing factors that you've found most directly influential and impactful in producing steak that is tender and that is flavorful? So, as I mentioned, number one, you got to start off with the genetics, and you know, just a lot of research out there on which bulls are going to produce the most tender product. 
as well as the best marbling. And with those, you generally get the, the flavor side of things as well, although not always. Uh, one interesting thing is you can tell by the color of the meat how tender it's going to be. Interesting. So everybody's heard of dark cutters. Uh, one of the interesting things is dark cutters are not caused by you know, the stressed animal and its genetics. You know, dark cutters are always pushed back to the farmer and the producer and saying, you know, somehow or another we got four dark cutters out of your load and we have to, you know, dock you for it. So first of all, dark cutters are tough. I mean, they are awful. You, you can barely make ground beef out of the whole animal. So somebody needs to take the hit, but to me it's not the farmer. Uh, Michigan State did a study, and I, you know, I've read it probably 15 years ago, so I, don't, I can't remember when it came out. But, uh, you know, they, were, they looked at it and said, what makes these dark cutters? And it came down to the blood sugar level. And so basically how long that calf has been off feed. And, and, you know, it makes so much sense. And we found out the hard way. We took a bunch of our steers to our local processor to be butchered. They had equipment breakdown and some personnel issues that day. They weren't able to get all of our beef butchered, so they let them stand in the pen for the next day until they butchered them the next day. Well, it was like 95 degrees out. These animals were hot, and they didn't have any feed for like 36 hours. And so we had like five of the six were dark cutters. Wow. And I said, wait a second here. You know, <laughs> we, you know, what's going on with these? We haven't had any dark cutters before. Why do we have dark cutters now? And that's when it led me to the Michigan State study. And so now we have very clear working relationship. First of all, we don't take them down to our processor until we know they're ready for them. And then if they have any issues, they need to call us and we bring feed to them and, and make sure that the animals are in good shape. And that. It's one interesting thing I tell anybody who's working with us that I want your cattle to be on feed until they walk onto the trailer. You know, it, and I'm fine paying for the feed that's in their gut that we're going to throw away. I just want to make sure their blood sugar level doesn't drop. That's fascinating. That's a fascinating tidbit. Yeah. I'm sure you've picked up many others of those as well. It goes counter to, to what the industry will tell you about, you know, dark cutters. Dark cutters are always the farmer's fault if you get docked for it. But if you think of these plants that butcher 6,000 or 8,000, 9,000 head a day, you know, a semi-trailer owns, uh, can handle 40 cattle. So you can just think of the number of trucks that are coming in and out of there and how long those cattle are waiting, you know, once they get unloaded as well as on the trucks and so forth. And, uh, you know, it just makes a lot of sense why, you know, they're going to have blood sugar drop. And you don't have to go to a dark cutter to start impacting tenderness. You know, once that blood sugar starts dropping, you, know, you right away start impacting it. That is interesting. Do you have any insights into how blood sugar affects the muscle density or what does it produce this particular effect? I'm sorry, I, I, I do not. Uh, like I said, it's probably been about 15 years since I read that Michigan State study. And, uh, you know, I would recommend people to Google search for that. And, well, you do know that time is no factor in, in memory and recollection. You can remember things from when you were two or four. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow or another, the older I get, the, the, the less that's working for me. <laughs> yeah. A moment ago, you mentioned uh, pricing and being able to price your products very well. How do your customers think about the quality of the meat that you're producing relative to what they could purchase elsewhere? And how has that influenced your ability to price your product? Most of the feedback we get on our quality is, is very good. And, and I think it's a you know, you had asked earlier, you know, how do we produce quality? And it's those genetics, it's the, the care of the animals and so forth. And it's also the feed program. Uh, there was another study I read. I can't remember who did, who did the study anymore. But basically said the calves need to gain 1.7 to 5 pounds per day, pretty well from weaning or even before weaning throughout the rest of their life at a minimum 1.75. So, you know, how a lot of people will put calves just out on perennial fat. Uh, pastures like fescue and so forth and you know it's really hard for a calf to keep that game going and I always explain it you know calves are like teenagers at that point you know teenagers are growing fast they're building muscle mass they're building bone structure and so forth and if you starve them with a low energy low protein diet what they do is they pull the fat cells out of the meat and those fat cells do not return once you do that. And so where our quality is, is really, I think, taking a leap above the conventional beef, uh, one aspect of it is that we make sure that they have a good diet in front of them their entire life. You know, I'm, I'm staring out my window right now at it. We've got about 80 acres 
of a cover crop that, or some people would call it a cover crop, but it's really our, our mixed crop for the summer. Our, I like to call it the C4 or the summer annuals. And, uh, you know, that mix, we got like an eight-way mix. And, I, you know, just looking at those calves, I know we're, we're meeting their requirement at that point. But if there's time period where, our, where we don't have the pasture, you know, for whatever reason, then we're supplementing them with a, with a TMR mix. Uh, a lot of distillers grains, a lot of silage. We do only silage. We don't make any hay on our farm. So that keeping them well fed, keeping them gaining, making sure they have the nutrition keeps those fat cells in the meat. And uh, you know, once those fat cells are gone, they're lost. So you know, the big feedlots will then pour grain to them at the end, and you know, they want those skinny calves. You know, the farmer gets penalized if he's not providing skinny calves. You know, going into the feedlot, and uh, ours are very fleshy. And then they put in 80% grain, where we put in 20% grain to our, for our finishers from about a thousand pounds on up. And so with that, we're producing small lines of outside fat, and we really get those little fat cells in the meat to really bloom to where they're, they're larger. But we don't have the big chunks of fat around the outside, and everybody's you know familiar with ribeyes, where you get that big chunk of fat down the middle of the ribeye. Uh, via genetics and with the feed program, we're able to really reduce that to where pretty well you know the whole steak is edible. So when we kind of explain that and show that to chefs and customers, that's when they're willing to pay more. And it's also interesting that the the big commodity guys, and you know, really it comes down to four companies in the U.S. beef market. And those guys, I always say, they leave us this opportunity. You know, and again, if you're doing 6,000, 8,000 head a day, you know, they're grading those in about three seconds is my understanding. They're looking at those cattle coming through. They cut through the 12th ribeye. They look at it. They make the determination, select, choice, and prime. Uh, what's interesting lately is most of those graders now are company employees. So uh, just like our kids in school, they, they've got great inflation going on as well. So uh, then what's amazing to me is then that ribeye then. Great inflation or great deflation? <laughs> great inflation <laughs> is, is how I would look at it is what used to be select is now choice. What used to be choice is now prime. And uh, so basically we've worked to try to improve that quality to let those chefs know how the quality is created and why it's different. And then the big guys, you know, I was just talking to a chef just a couple of weeks ago. And he explained to me that he got three ribeyes in a case. One was fine. One looked really good. One was light-colored pink, and it was tougher. And one didn't have the marbling. And they're all in the case, all marked high choice. Yep, interesting. And you got to look at it from a chef's perspective, too, or a restaurateur. They're trying to please their customer. You know, at the end of the day, the person sitting coming to that restaurant is the one who determines whether it's high quality or not. And so... One is the consistent sizing, you know, so if you've got a table of eight people or four people and they, two of them order the same steak, one comes out looking very different from the other, it just, it just has a bad impression on the customer. So that portion, then also just the taste profile, you know, when you bite into that steak, is it a really good, you know, feeling in your mouth? So to me, that quality level and that consistency and quality is what's critical to, to trying to get a premium price. One of the pieces that you haven't mentioned so frequently when I, when I have conversations with Stefan Van Vliet on steak quality or on others, or particularly on the flavor aspect, one of the pieces that I often hear emphasized is uh, the diversity of plants going into the diet. And you mentioned that you're doing an eight-way mix. How, how important do you believe um, having plant diversity in that diet is? to producing the, the flavorfulness that you are looking for. And it's, it's also interesting, like it's on one hand, um, I heard you mention that you are feeding distillers grains and you're feeding corn. And I know there's a certain segment of people who listen to the podcast who might hear that and, and cringe. And yet you're producing very high quality meat and very high quality, at least from a, from a flavorfulness perspective, it would be interesting to know what, that would look like from an omega-3, omega-6 fatty acid ratio, et cetera. I'm guessing you might have done that. But how, how are you thinking about uh, the components of the diet in producing flavorfulness and producing quality? To me, it's, it's kind of like a crop, 
right? You got to have all the micronutrients as well as the macronutrients. So just feeding enough carbohydrates and protein isn't enough. You know, you got to have that wide variety, and, and that's why you know I love these crop mixes that we plant because I I know that's getting that that wider variety. You know, in the same way with humans, right? You know, I saw a podcast the other day that said that we should be eating 30 different types of vegetables in a week. You know, every week to get that wide variety of, of nutrients. And so, you know, I, I definitely agree, you know, the same thing with cattle. And so we feed a mix that's got corn silage in it. A lot of times we'll also do forage sorghum, uh, distiller's grains, and then we do add about 20% grain to the diet. And, and we do that to really blossom that, those fat cells and to get that, what we're considering quality, to have those fat cells, those little fat cells in the meat. Interesting, you talked about omega-3s and omega-6s. We have not done that study yet on our beef, but I do have a neighbor who raises beef just like we do, and he sells his at farmer's markets and so forth, and he's very concerned uh, about the omega-3s and omega-6s. And by feeding the exact same way we are, his, uh, his ratio is actually higher than, grass, than the average grass-finished beef. But wait, hang on a second. Yes. That's just the opposite of everything that we're told is possible. Right. Now, again, we're not feeding conventional beef type approach. We're 80% forage, 20% grain at the finish. So we've got a high forage diet the whole way. And uh, yeah, like I said, I don't know for sure on ours yet. We're, that's kind of a next phase we'd like to get into. Uh, but I would really suspect we're going to have some pretty good results on it. All right. Well, I'll be looking forward to that because that, uh, that, could, be another, uh, that could be another paradigm buster right. in a good right. way. Yep. Yeah, so we've spoken about the quality and pricing, but I actually think I want, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of our listeners are interested in how are you able to price your products compared to the mainstream? Yeah, you know, historically, we've probably been 30 to 40% above, you know, high quality beef. You know, we're not going to compare ourselves with the supermarket ground beef and so forth. But, you know, higher quality uh, beef, we're in that 30 to 40% above just because of our processing costs when it comes down to it. You know, we can raise animals fairly, you know, competitively, not as cheap as the big guys. And, you know, we don't do growth hormones. We don't do anything along those lines. Uh, no ractopamine or anything that really, you know, is, is a chemical to produce faster growth. So without those, yes, our cost of production is higher. But where our costs are really higher than the big guys is in our processing. You know, we're still in that 800 to $900 per animal range to process a beef and that's all the way through with patties and you know whatever we need to do on it so that compared to you know I've heard the big guys you know years ago I, I heard they were around hundred and fifty dollars a head but that doesn't include all the further processing so you know by the time you get that done it's probably three hundred dollars somewhere in that range so still you know one-third of our processing cost that plus our higher production costs is where we have to make it up on price and do you think your higher processing costs are just a more reflection of, of compensating labor well, or are they a reflection of your cutting to order and rapid order turnaround, rapid cutting process? What, uh, what, is, what, are, what is contributing to that? To me, the biggest thing is a small plant. You know, we're, we're utilizing a plant that at its maximum can butcher 30 beef in a day, you know, you know compared to these huge numbers. And so... Yeah. That part, as well as, you know, we're processing on burger, you know, lines that, you know, produce a stack of burgers and so forth. And, uh, you know, it, you see the other lines where they're producing like four burgers a second. I saw one line doing that. Uh, you know, their labor cost, their equipment cost uh, that are spread out over more pounds is, is a lot less than, than ours. You mentioned your very first restaurant customer choose to buy from you because you were local. And today you have these diverse crop mixers. You're feeding a high forage diet. And I haven't even looked at your website. Do you market yourself as regenerative? And I guess my question is, do your customers actually care about regenerative practices or, or um, is that a factor at all? They do. But I would say, again, in the restaurant business, what they told us was quality is number one. Clean meat is number two. And then all the other things, sustainable, what we're doing on carbon sequestration and so forth, is down lower on their list. But, but you can't treat each customer as the same note. 
each, you know, Indiana University is very interested in our sustainability practices. They come down and, and we've had, I, I remember in 2008, we did a, a quick analysis of our carbon footprint back then. So they're very interested in that. We hold uh, or host three classes a year that they come and visit us on the farm and really understand that. But then, you know, you've got other restaurants who really aren't interested in that at all. They just want good quality. And, you know, one thing we knew early on is we needed to establish a brand. That's why we sell everything under Fisher Farms, even though our hogs come from Gook Sale Farms, our neighbors. We talked to some early customers and said, okay, should we call this Gook Sale Farms pork and Fisher Farms beef? And they said, you know, just way too confusing. Call it all Fisher Farms. We put it real clear on our website where our pork comes from, and that just you know, makes it easier for the customer. But, you know, again, the cleanliness of the meat is one area that I think continues to grow. Uh, back when we first started, uh, everybody was about local and try to be hyper-local and those kind of things. Now I really feel like people are really into, you know, what's in this meat and what's in the food that I'm eating? What are all these chemicals? I was about to ask you the question of what does a restaurant mean when they say they want clean meat? What defines clean meat? And again, everybody's got a different definition. What we say is, first of all, there's no chemicals added during processing, so we don't use any gases to brighten up the meat to make it pretty red or anything like that. We don't add any MSG to our sausages. You know, we, we try to use the rule that, you know, if that ingredient list includes something that's not commonly found in your kitchen, so it's not a spice, it's not a whole food, then it, it's not going to be in our product. So that's part of it. Then the other side is how you raise the animal. And what we really stress uh, is no chemicals going into our animals. So, again, no ractopamine, which is very common now in beef, uh, no growth hormones, no antibiotics except for when a calf is sick and never within six months of processing. And so we administer antibiotics to an individual animal, not to a group of animals and feed and those kind of things. So just a, a lot of little things to try to make that animal's meat just as clean as possible. We're not organic. Uh, we've looked at that many times. And uh, you know what we keep coming back to is our cost would just skyrocket trying to go organic. And we just don't feel like our customers are willing to pay for that. You know, there is a subset of the market that will, and that's great. And I refer those folks to other people. There's a subset of the market that really wants grass finished. And I promote Seven Sons here in Indiana. They do a great job on grass finishing beef. Uh, that's not our market. Yep. And I would say that's probably one thing I would suggest to people as well is don't try to be everything to everybody. You know, pick an area, focus on that. And that's really what we've done. And our philosophy on that hasn't changed since day one. As you've become better known in the local marketplace, how have you found the market demand to match with your supply? And it's, I find it interesting to consider all the, the cutting to order that you are doing and the very rapid order turnaround. That also takes the right processing partner you're very fortunate to have that processing partner, but all the whole demand supply chain. You're uh, obviously with your background in uh, in supply chain logistics and processing this. Uh, it's, it looks to me like you're running extremely tight on supply chain and on supply matching demand. Mm -hmm. So, uh, have you encountered situations where demand exceeds supply? How do you manage those situations? We always try to forecast our beef production to be about 30% more than what we expect to sell. And so, and, and again, we're doing that over the last 15 years, we've added cooperative herds. So a lot is, it's, it's kind of a fancy term for uh, neighbors and farmers that, that we've known you know, for a long time that are working with us now. And they've really uh, steered their genetics, pardon the pun, I, I just had to say it, but they're steering their genetics to, <laughs> to really meet what we're looking for. And you know, I had conversations yesterday uh, in real good detail with a neighbor and you know what bulls to select and those kind of things. And so we have that supply and of course we can always sell those to the conventional market. Uh, we don't want to. And luckily, with the exception of 2020 when COVID hit, uh, we've always had that growing demand. And so it's, it's more of a we're chasing and, and trying to, to get more and more demand. When COVID hit, and we've had a few other times where we're like, oh boy, you know, we've got a lot more cattle than, than our supply. And the nice thing with cattle, especially if you're trying to produce that prime plus, you know, you can hold them another month or maybe a month and a half. 
and you know you're holding them they're getting bigger so you know you're not totally losing out on the feed that that you're supplying to them and also that you know the the quality of the you know and the fat composition just really increases the longer you hold them so we've got that flexibility especially on our farm we'll hold cattle for a longer time period it's key not to try to push them out the door when they're not really finished that's one interesting thing i, I might dive into a, a second is when we uh, first started, like I said, I was taking videos of the cattle that I was picking out. And what I would also do is put them into our chute. You know, first of all, I would weigh them, but then I would take a 12 inch ruler and put that in front of the back legs of the cattle. So, you know, on the back, but right up in front of the back legs. And if that ruler could touch, you know, flesh on both sides, there weren't any air pockets, then I knew that calf was finished. Basically that back just kind of flattens out over those last months whenever they really get finished. And so that, that's been a big determinant. And, and, you know, selecting those cattle, knowing which ones are finished, it, is really critical as well to, to maintain that quality. But once they get finished like that, like I said, you've got some leeway that, you know, you can hold them a little bit longer. So one other thing we did, you know, kind of realizing early on that we wanted to supply restaurants and knowing that, you know, you got to be there every week. You know, I've had a lot of farmers call me up and say, you know, hey, I, you know, I want to do what you guys are doing. You know, how do I get into it? And the first thing I'll say is, okay, how many cows you got, right? And they'll say, hey, I got 100 cows. And I'm like, okay, you keep back some heifers and so forth, so now you're going to be marketing 50, 60, you know, beef a year. The restaurants don't want you to come to them and say, I've got beef now for the next three months, and then I'll be back to you next year and, you know, nine months later. You know, it, it doesn't work that way for restaurants. They need a consistent supply, and, uh, and, and that was probably the hardest thing for us getting started. And, and I think that's one thing people have to understand is, you know, you got to balance that whole animal. And our growth, that's really been the biggest constraint on us as, as we grow. You know, everybody always wants fillets. They want ribeyes. They want New York strips and so forth. But you also got to sell those chucks. you got to sell the short ribs. You, get, you know, you got to sell the brisket. you got to sell everything for above conventional beef prices. You know, there's not one part of our animal that we sell at conventional prices. And that's, like I said, we're at a disadvantage on the processing side. I should point out, I didn't mention it, um, about three years ago, it was May of 21, uh, we moved into a new processing plant. So again, with our partner, Sander Processing, we built this new plant. It's mostly dedicated to us, probably 90% of the plant is, is focused on our production. And then beside their plant, we built an order fulfillment center uh, where we've got our employees, you know, packaging, boxing, and so forth. And we're actually getting ready to go through a big expansion here and uh, we're hoping to break ground in September uh, to add to that and really take over a lot of the further processing and do more streamlined processing so we can reduce cost. But, you know, kind of getting back to my, you know, initial point that, you know, the hardest thing in all of this, you know, selling meat locally and so forth, is balancing that animal. In pork, it's not as difficult as it is in beef. Uh, there's just not as big of a difference in pork chops and versus pork shoulders and sausage in price. Uh, so, you know, you can grind a pork loin into sausage, actually, right now. I don't follow the commodity market very much, but our processor was telling me that pork loins are cheaper than pork shoulders right now. And so, yeah, again, it's just kind of the the supply and demand across the pork industry. But on the beef side, you can't do that. You know, there's no way, you know, you just can't come out, you know, can't grind ribeyes, can't grind New York strips. I always say anything with the last name of steak, you can't grind it. Last name of roast, it, it's fair game. When you have a need for a constant um, beef supply, constant production year-round, does that mean you're also calving year-round? We are. So we calve on our farm from really about the end of April until Christmas. And that's our time period. And we did that because most of the other farmers in our area and farmers that we buy calves from and so forth are calving in that January to March time frame. So it, it's worked out well. Like I said, we rent a lot of farms. A lot of those farms don't want our cattle on their farm until the grass greens up and so forth. And we don't like trying to calve out on dirt lots and so forth. So we wait until we take those cows out in the spring and then we usually want to have them out there for a month before they start calving. And so we'll calve, like I said, April till December. And, and that has worked well for us to get that year-round supply of beef. So 
Dave, I do want to speak about your, your farming operation a little bit as right. well. But in the discussion around beef so far, you've mentioned several ideas that I have not heard before. The idea of maintaining blood sugar levels, the idea of, of constant weight gain for young calves and so forth. What other things do you do or what other ideas do you have that are uh, that could be very valuable that are not widely known? I'm trying to think as far as raising the animals, those are probably the two key things to it. Uh, you know, the, I would say the other thing is just we put our cattle into huge barns for the last three months. And we do that just so they're not out or, you know, running around on pasture to where they're you know, being chased by dogs or whatever. They're in a very calm environment. Uh, we bed with sawdust from local wood furniture factory. And we're doing that just to get these calves in a very calm environment. We also give them like three times the recommended space. So they've got plenty of space. They've, these buildings have 16 feet tall uh, to the rafters so and open sides. So it's very airy, a lot of good uh, ventilation. We've got an eight inch roof vent across the top. So, you know, I always say it feels like you're standing underneath a shade tree when you're in these buildings. And for those last three months, that's, that's really critical for the cattle to just be in a calm environment. Just have a, a lazy day of, of going up and eating, drinking the water, and, and laying back down in the sawdust is what you know, we'd like to see. When I pull up to those barns in my side-by-side, -side, one of the things I always do is turn off the engine and listen. And if you don't hear any cows mooing or coughing, it's a very good thing. And cows will tell you when they're out of feed, when they're out of water, they'll tell you that. When there's any kind of stress going on, they'll tell you as well. And so I always like to, to just hear that there's no coughing, there's no, nothing bad going on. And generally, in the finishing barns by those age, we, we generally don't have any kind of illness. I, I should say we do also feed probiotics. Uh, I'm a big believer in probiotics, both for humans as well as uh, for cattle. I know my uh, sister is a pediatrician, and uh, she always prescribed probiotics anytime. She also prescribed antibiotics to children. And, and to me, it just makes you know, a lot of sense. Yeah, I think we could have interesting conversations around probiotics and, uh, again, coming back to plant species diversity. So let's, let's talk a bit about the, the farming side. And, and also, you have livestock in the barns for the last three months of their life. What does the remainder of their life look like? Are you uh, grazing? Does well, you mentioned earlier that a majority of their feed is coming from forage, but how much of that? How much of that is self forage versus fed? What does that process look like? Yeah, it really varies uh, time of year and the age of the calf. You know, until they get to about eight hundred pounds, I want it to be mostly grazing. Uh, so they'll be out on pasture, and we use a lot of annuals for their grazing just to make sure we're getting a high quality diet. So like I said, we've got an eight-way summer mix that they're out grazing on now. Uh, in September, we'll convert that to ryegrass. Uh, I'm known uh, throughout the area as the uh, ryegrass lover and so forth. I always call it my beloved ryegrass. And I started with that. Uh, so it, if I can go down the, the ryegrass uh, wormhole. Here. Please, I was about to ask you, <laughs> why, why do you love ryegrass? Well, do, do we have three hours? Uh, my, <laughs> my wife always kidding me. I was talking well, to a University of Kentucky a forage professor one time, and uh, you know we were going into the details of ryegrass, and he kind of looked at his watch and was like, well, D Dave, I, I, I really got to head out. And my wife said, Dave, you even bored a forage specialist on ryegrass. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what type of ryegrass are you talking about? Annual ryegrass? Yes, annual ryegrass. So with annual ryegrass, we plant that after our corn crop or our forage uh, sorghum crop uh, or after these summer mixes. Uh, we, plant, we plant about 300 acres of that a year, uh, sometimes a little bit more. We're probably closer actually to 400. But and I should say how we started with it. Let me jump back to that a little bit. So uh, I've got a neighbor dairy farm that I've worked with over the years and really kind of try to understand you know, what they're doing. I, I always like dairies in that. They get a report card every day on how well their cattle were fed. And in the beef, you know, we just don't get that. So, you know, what I learned from them was the corn silage and then a cover crop. What they were doing at the time was wheat uh, with a little uh, crimson clover. And uh, so we started off with, with that as a rotation on, on some of these crop acres. And then about, let's see if I get my dates right, it was around 2009 or so, my local Purdue 
uh, extension guy, or actually he's the manager of uh, the livestock farm that Purdue has close to us. It's about 20 minutes away from us, and so I've really learned a lot from him and you know what, what Purdue is doing in studies and so forth. He came and uh, we talked it through and, and said, you know, why don't you try some of these other, you know, crops and so forth. So we tried cereal rye, we tried uh, barley, triticale, you know, just a, a whole slew of them one year. Uh, I had a different field or a different crop in every field just, just to try it out. And uh, what I fell in love with at the time was ryegrass. And what was interesting to me is one is what I liked about it was it's growing all winter long. You know, again, we're in southern Indiana, so any day above 45 degrees, that annual ryegrass will grow. It's not going to grow a whole lot, but it's green, it's active, it's putting biology down in the soil. You know, it's just healthy all winter long. So uh, I probably, before I forget, if any listeners out there thinking about planting ryegrass, i got to give you the one caveat. When I first started with it, they told me don't graze it tight. You know, you got to leave some leaf out there, you know, when the winter storms come through and so forth. Uh, what I found out, to keep it healthy and keep it alive, you want to graze it tight. Uh, so our rule is by 1st of January, I like to have it only, you know, two, three inches out of the ground because January is about the only time we get the polar vortexes that come down and it gets minus five, minus 10 and so forth. We'll get those for just a couple days. Usually it's not an issue. But if you've got ryegrass that's 12 inches tall and a polar vortex comes down, it'll turn that whole plant yellow and it'll mat itself out or it'll create this huge mat. And I've had fields before yep. that just look like a big yellow carpet. And I'll run cattle out into it, and they won't touch the stuff. And then come springtime, because it's smothered out, it won't regrow. So you know, we use a no-till drill to plant it all. We do everything no-till. We, we don't do any tillage. So with that no-till drill, we'll put it in. And that's another interesting thing we found out. You know, It says on, on the seed and so forth to plant it a half inch deep, no more than an inch. We found two inches is best. Especially, you know, you got to remember, we're planting this in September. And so very low moisture. We're always, it seems like we're always in a drought in September and June, which apparently are, you know, the two months that we're planting crops. So it makes it most difficult. But if you plant it two inches deep where that moisture is at, and, you know, we're planting it in a mixture. So it's, it's annual ryegrass. It's usually wheat, uh, some clover and so forth. We put those all in the, the big seed box and plant those all together two inches deep. And, you know, what I've heard on different podcasts and so forth, and I think Rick Clark has talked about it, where those, some of those crops will kind of break open the ground and let those crops that normally need to be planted, you know, shallower uh, to, to come up through it. And with that, I, I think you get the deeper roots when the cows come along to eat it. They're not pulling it out of the ground. But the number one thing is by having it down there, we get the moisture uh, so the crop can take off in, in September when it's generally dry here. So yeah, yeah, I I really recommend that on the annual ryegrass. The bad thing about annual ryegrass is it needs nitrogen. What happened in that first field that you fell into love with it so much? Oh yeah, yeah. So what I really liked was the roots, the tremendous root system that it has. So and I was thinking, hey, in the top six to twelve inches is all I really noticed at first. It's got such a root system, and you know the analysis it's. Annual ryegrass is 4,000 pounds of roots on a dry matter basis per acre. Wheat is 1,500. So nearly three times as many roots. And, and they're very fine, fibrous roots. And when you've got those up on top, and, and what I first, why I first fell in love with it is I can run calves out on it all winter long. And, you know, we're in an area where we get close to 50 inches of rain a year, a lot of that coming during the winter. We get a lot of rain in, in winter months to where our fields get, as I call it, mucky uh, real easy. And so generally we don't graze our cows anymore on the ryegrass in the winter months. We graze our calves. And with that great root system, it holds the calves up. And they, and they don't get down in the mud. They, they don't tear up the soil as much. And that's really that and the fact that it's growing you know, all throughout the winter are the two main things that, that said, okay, I'm going to go with just annual ryegrass. And I say just, but again, it's the base of the mix that we're using. But then in 2017, Dr. Lloyd Murdoch from the University of Kentucky came and visited our farm. Uh, I remember it was October, I actually remember it, October 17th. We had planted the ryegrass on August 28th that year. And uh, we had a really nice 
September. This grass was probably 16, 18 inches tall. I had cows out there grazing it. Just a, you know, a beautiful scenario, beautiful fields and so forth. And uh, he came because he has done a lot of research on breaking up the fragipan in the soil. And uh, I'm sure a lot of your listeners are, are familiar with fragipan, big issue here in our area in southern Indiana, all through Kentucky and so forth. So he was trying to figure out ways of breaking up that fragipan. And uh, I'd really recommend people, if they're interested, go check out the website. Just do a... Yeah, he's done really great yeah, work. Really, really good stuff. Yep. So he came to our farm and he looked at a field and we had this field I actually bought from our neighbors back in 2005. And before I bought it, for years it was conventionally planted. Uh, he also did some no-till, but it was always corn or soybeans every year. And I looked at it and it said, well, you know, part of this field really has too much slope to it. I'm going to put a fence down the middle of it. And this one side I planted into permanent pasture. And I said, hey, you know, I'm going to make sure I'm not eroding our soils, blah, blah, blah. So I did that. And he came and looked at it. And he had his core truck to where he could do a deep core. And he did a core on both sides of the fence. And it was the same exact slope where he did the core. These were probably only maybe... 150 feet apart where he did them. And where we had been doing ryegrass now for seven years, uh, we had 9.9 .9 inches of topsoil. Where we did ryegrass, or where we hadn't done any ryegrass, where we had converted this to permanent pasture, everything else was the same. We had 3.75 inches of topsoil. So we had grown six, over six inches of topsoil in seven years. And the way we're doing that and, and why we're really, you know, into all, all the ryegrass now and what kind of clued me into it, you know, he was digging up these cores. And even by then, I think the ryegrass had been growing for 45 days and we had 29 inch deep roots. So what he explained to me is this ryegrass, it is the most pressure at the end of a root of any of the species that he had messed with. It had 100 PSI. And I don't know how he measured that and so forth, but it's got 100 PSI at that tip of that root just pushing down into the ground. It'll push down, find the cracks in the, in the fragipan. And if everybody knows the fragipan where you have those prisms, and in between the prisms you have more of the gray structure, and that's uh, easier to penetrate. So those roots would penetrate down through that, but also get into those prisms as well. And so it does that one year. When it comes through the next year and it goes down those same channels, finds those areas, and as it's doing it, it breaks apart the fragipan both physically but also chemically. And he's got a, a great thing on his website where he shows two mason jars, one that's got water in it. The other mason jar has a ryegrass root extract, which, which I, I'm sure he had some Ph.D. students working for him boil some ryegrass roots and uh, put those in this jar. Then he takes two lumps of fragipan, puts it in the one with water, and puts it in the one with the ryegrass uh, extract. Wait two weeks, you come back, the one that's in water, it just looks like you've got a rock in the bottom of a uh, water. The other one, you've got really cloudy water, and that fragipan is just dissolved because of these salts that the roots give off. And so, though, and he lists all the different salts that are coming out of those roots, but it really has worked to break up that frangipan. So after he explained this all to us, then we really went hog wild on, on ryegrass and, and really pushed the, the envelope. And, and one of the things I love about it is I get all this winter grazing. But then about 1st of April, we'll pull all the calves, all the cattle off of the annual ryegrass because now our permanent pastures are greening up and so forth. So we'll put them off on that. And then between April 1 and May 15th, We'll go from two inch tall ryegrass that's just been grazed down to five foot tall ryegrass and really thick. And then we'll go out and, and chop that ryegrass. And, uh, you know, we've just got a tremendous feed source as well. Are you making baleage out of that, I presume? We did at first. Now we do everything with, with a chopper and, and we make actual, you know, regular silage. So we put in a silage bit. One of the concerns that I constantly hear being raised about annual ryegrass, and by the way, it's one that I don't particularly share, but I constantly hear farmers asking the question, well, how do you manage it if it escapes? Yeah. And what are your thoughts? How do you manage ryegrass? So 
first of all, if you're planting wheat for grain, I would be a little bit more careful about it. I'll put it that way. But what we've seen is that last, when you're ready to kill it, you want to let it grow tall and cut it. You don't want to graze it. Uh, we've tried grazing it, and we'll have spots in the field where it's 16 inches tall yet because, you know, for whatever reason, the, the cattle didn't graze it down tight. One of our difficulties is we can't really do rotational grazing with ryegrass through the winter months just begin because we're trying to spread out that load, and they would just muck up the fields too bad if we do rotational grazing where we get it down tight. But, you know, I, I've kind of tried to think through that, and even if you do rotational grazing, you know, now you got a small part of the field that's grazed tight. The other part has come back. So anyways, what we do is we let it grow 45 days. We cut it with a hay bind. We then come through with our chopper, and we let it grow back about three or four days to make sure it's got leaf on it, and then we hit it with a light uh, application of glyphosate. And with that, we get full kill on it. It it's really hasn't been an issue by doing that. And then what I love is then we no-till right into that ground and to get the, you know, the corn in the ground, smashed the wheels to get it really good soil to seed contact. Uh, we found that out with forage sorghum as well. You really got to have good soil to seed contact. Our ground is very loose because of the annual ryegrass, because of all these roots. The last thing you want to do is disc it. Uh, a neighbor of mine that I convinced to plant uh, the annual ryegrass uh, he went out there with the disc the next year, and he called me up, not very happy because he had to disc his field three times to get those root wads, you know, broken right. up. And so obviously my first question is, why are you disking at all? Just go and plant directly into those that ryegrass stubble, and uh, he switched and done that, and now he plants over a thousand acres of ryegrass every year. So I, you know, I've heard the same concern. It's a very valid concern. It's a very hardy plant. Uh, and the other thing I should mention is. It loves nitrogen. So, you know, you got to plant it with legumes or legumes ahead of it or be ready to put nitrogen on. And the, one of the amazing things I found out about it is we had a early spring one year, and it was April 12th, that we did our first cutting of annual ryegrass. It was a beautiful crop. We cut it, and I had just applied nitrogen for, to it two weeks earlier. And I thought, well, it's got plenty of nitrogen left, you know, and I'll just let it regrow. But that crop had sucked in all the nitrogen. And uh, it, it will really test high in protein. Uh, again, my neighbor, Dairy, tested some last year where he had spread some cattle manure. He had 44% protein in his ryegrass. Yikes. Talk to other folks, yeah. Yeah, and you have to be very careful how to feed that then. But I talked to professors and so forth that talk about how ryegrass is one of those crops that will suck all the nitrogen up into it. And so once you cut it, there's not nitrogen left. And so for the next crop or for even for it to regrow. So you got to just be aware of that and make sure that when you're planting your corn crop that you put some nitrogen with it, either two by two or actually two by two, uh, to make sure that there's nitrogen available for, for the next crop. Yeah, it sounds like that could be a really interesting conversation. I would bet that at 44% protein, that's not all true protein. It hasn't all been converted yet, but yeah, that's... That's a fascinating characteristic of a plant that can be taken advantage of or that can take advantage of you if you don't manage it well. Exactly, exactly. So, Dave, it strikes me through the course of this conversation, you've been on a fascinating journey. You've discovered lots of interesting tidbits. What are you working on right now? What are you researching? What problems would you love to solve? We're always developing new things. So one of the things I really am focused on this year is trying to improve that cool season mix. Our goal is to get it to where we have no nitrogen fertilizer uh, in the cool season mix, as well as with our summer annuals. I think we've achieved that now in our summer annuals. The difficulty in our cool season mix is how aggressive and competitive ryegrass is that it likes to smother out the other crops, uh, especially like clovers that like to just put that, you know, the, the little, I don't know, the little growth, and I forget the, the term nodules? for it anymore. No, the, the top growth out of it, you know, just the, the little star that, that, you know, clover starts off with in the fall, right. you know, and then, you know, it's developing a root system, but if you've got so much ryegrass around it, it smothers it out. So we're looking at, you know, what's the combination of plants uh, that we'll be able to grow during that, that winter season. 
I should also mention, you know, I talked about our fall calving cows. Most of those will calve here at our home farm. And what we do with those is we'll have the cows, you know, in a permanent pasture, but also has a bunk line along it to where we can feed those cows silage. But then we've got a wire, and we found out about 42 inches is about the right height in between those fields and ryegrass fields. And 42 inches allows those calves to creep underneath and do creep grazing all winter long out on that ryegrass. And so the, it's a really a critical part to our operation. Those calves stay nice and healthy, really nice and fleshy. You know, they look better than our summer calves just because of that high quality forage that, that they're available to all winter long. So I've got to leave ryegrass in the mix. I'm, I'm not going to sacrifice <laughs> ryegrass because all the things we do with it, but also how it's building our soil. And so now I've got to figure out, okay, what other mixes you know, can I put in it to really reduce the, the uh, nitrogen use? Have you found any plants that, are, that seem to hold promise at this point? I'm thinking about Balanza clover. I'm guessing you've probably tried that already. I have Balanza. Uh, it works when we plant it early enough, and if I dropped our rate down to about 7 pounds an acre of annual ryegrass. Generally, we're planting around 22 pounds an acre of annual ryegrass, and at that level, it, it really smothers it out. So I like Balanza. Uh, I like what it's done. I'm just not for sure if I'll get enough winter grazing if I just do, you know, the right guy. So we, we put a lot of wheat in. You know, that's the one thing I should mention as well. What I really like about wheat, our sewer rye or barley mixed in with ryegrass, is it holds the ryegrass upright. So when you get into that high growth time period in the spring and that ryegrass likes to grow to maybe 16, 18 inches and then it falls over. And, and, and when it falls over, it's not doing as much photosynthesis. It's not growing as much. Uh, but also it's harder to harvest. And so with that wheat in there, and, and generally kind of our, our historical mix has been about 50 pounds of wheat and 22 pounds of ryegrass, that combination really holds that ryegrass you know, vertically to where it'll grow to that five, six feet tall. So again, we've tried a lot of clovers, we've tried brassicas and so forth. Uh, and, and again, we're not done trying Austrian winter peas. Uh, we've done those. I was about to say, winter peas or even, I mean, you're mild enough. Well, you get some polar vortex temperatures coming down. I was almost going to uh, wonder about fava beans, but I'm not sure they're a right fit. So, uh, and I should get into a little bit of why we're so interested in our nitrogen reduction. So, we were lucky to get a Climate Smart grant. We've got one of the bigger ones, so we're a $15 million project over five years. And what the USDA, you know, I've heard people asking, you know, why did you guys get this grant? And my guess is why the USDA selected us is because our work with ryegrass, that we've built our soils. We've got professors that have looked at our soils and shown how much we've built organic matter. You can very easily translate organic matter to carbon that we've been able to sequester. So we've got this grant to really focus on that, but then also because we sell directly to the end customer, we can extract the value for having climate smart product being sold to them. And that was a big emphasis that the USDA wanted to learn about is, you know, how do you get customers to pay a premium for these products? So that's a big part of our, our research as well. But a big part of the project is just researching how stable is that carbon that we're putting in the ground? How deep are we putting in the ground? What are the different forms of carbon and so forth? So uh, part of our grant is paying for a company out of Bloomington, Indiana called Geospherics, uh, which is doing a lot of this work on our farm They've pulled in uh, Dr. Craig Rasmussen from the University of Arizona, who is the editor of Soil Science Journal. I mean, this guy knows his soils. He came the first couple weeks of the project. He spent uh, a week on our farm really analyzing what we're doing. We got the NRCS to come out and dig the core samples. So last year we did 90 core samples across our farm. We even went into our woods. It's really fascinating to me that, you know, if you look at our farm, where we're at, it was all hardwoods. You know, 200 years ago, this was all hardwood. And when the settlers moved here in the mid to early 1800s, they cleared off those hardwoods, and what they found was about four to six inches of topsoil. You know, because, it, again, trees generally don't build the soil deep. They're, they're not like the, the prairies and so forth that had those deep-rooted grasses. And, and that's one way I explain it to people, is what we're trying to do is mimic those deep-rooted grasses of the plains. 
uh, and we're doing that with annual crops. And uh, I was happy to hear Dr. Christine Jones uh, say when, when we met with her a few weeks ago, you know, the number one way to build soil is to plant those annuals. You know, multiple annual species don't just rely on that perennial. And, and we looked at it as we want the fastest growing crop out there and the right crop at the right temperature. So basically, you know, C3 crops in the cool season, C4 in the summer, to make sure that we've got as much photosynthesis going on that's feeding that, the microbes in the soil. So anyways, we've done a lot of analysis on that and so forth, but we also did an LCA, you know, a life cycle assessment on our carbon footprint as part of this grant is to really analyze where we're putting carbon into the ground, you know, where we're sequestering it, how much we're sequestering, uh, and I'll just give the, the initial results are somewhere around a ton of carbon per acre that we're putting down into the ground that we're actually sequestering. That's per crop cycle? That's significant. Yes, it's huge. But if you think about it, we have 4,000 pounds of annual ryegrass roots. we got 4,000 pounds of corn roots or forage sorghum roots on those same fields every year. So we've got 8,000 pounds of roots. We also are putting that manure and we're putting the sawdust on our fields. You know, we go through two semi-loads of sawdust in a month. So it, it's a lot of sawdust that's mixed in with the manure going back out on those fields. So all of that kind of helps to count towards our carbon sink. But then we have to look at, okay, where is carbon going up into the air? And again, through this life cycle assessment that this team has done, what we've really discovered is our two main issues is nitrogen fertilizer. And we've known for a long time, you know, that nitrogen can basically vaporize and turn into nitrous oxide and so forth, and those are bad things. Uh, nitrous oxide is 300 times worse than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. So, you know, you can use stabilizers to keep it from vaporizing, but, and also stabilizers to keep it from leaching. But one of the big problems with nitrogen is before it even comes into your farm. Uh, just the energy required to produce that nitrogen fertilizer has such a huge carbon footprint that you, know, you can't get around that on your farm. You, you're not going to reduce it with different practices on your farm once you buy that, that fertilizer. So we're really looking at ways to reduce that. You know, that's why we're doing all the trials that I've talked to you personally about before where we're, we're trying to figure out you know, are there different uh, bugs in the jug that will work to reduce that nitrogen fertilizer. And part of the interesting thing, and, and I know I'm diving down a wormhole here, is the work we've done on just building our organic matter. So we got some fields that were less than 2% that are now over 5% uh, in 20 years. So we've really built the organic matter. Uh, but when doing that, we've really bloomed our microbiome. You know, we've got a lot of biology in the soil. We did six Haney tests last year. Uh, five came back very high, one came back high. So we've got a, already a lot of biology. So then we were out there trying to use products like uh, I shouldn't say product, should I? So anyways, the, the typical bugs in a jug <laughs> that, that are supposed to be producing nitrogen. But, you know, you're putting on two quarts to an acre. And uh, there's a University of Kentucky study just came out last year that showed the average pasture has 2,000 pounds of biology in the pasture. So you're putting on two quarts or a quart. You're just putting on a minuscule amount. And it, I always use my analogy of, it's like putting a Cub Scout out in the middle of the woods and saying survive. And he's surrounded by all these critters that have been out in the woods and they know how to survive and he's not equipped to survive. Well, we're doing the same thing with this biology. We're putting it out there and it's surrounded by all the biology that has thrived in that environment. And we're introducing biology from outside that environment. Well, is it really going to take off? Is it really going to make a difference? And, and that's been our issue. We haven't seen any advantage to adding that level of microbes. Uh, we're trying a new product this year from a company called Farm Grade uh, out of uh, Idaho. Oh dear, that's root of the wrong name, Dave. You should be trying a new product from a company called Advancing Eco Agriculture. Oh my goodness, what are we talking about here? <laughs> well, uh, we're gonna have a conversation I, after this. <laughs> so we are trying some products from AEA as well. And, all right, uh, all right. We're doing a bunch of trials with that as well. The, and I should say the issue we've seen is we're not seeing an impact with the biology. Even at the high levels that they want us to put on, you know, their product is much more concentrated. There's like 30 different biologies in the product. 
our 30 different microbes. And we were supposed to put 20 gallons per an acre, and we did that on our ryegrass this spring, and we still didn't see a benefit. Mm -hmm. And again, my guess is that we've got so much competing biology already out there that their product works well in, you know, in low yep. organic matter soils, but not in the, the high organic matter soils that, that we have in the high biology. Were any of the products that you've uh, experimented with put on uh, in close proximity to the seed as a seed treatment, or they're putting on separately? No, we, we put them on not as an actual seed treatment, uh, but we have put them in furrow. Yeah. We've done that both with our drill. We've got our drill set up to where we can put product in, in furrow as well. And, uh, and, and again, we, we just haven't seen the, seen the benefits to doing that. I'm not giving up on biology. I, I think it's critical. I, I think biology, it, it seems like every place I turn, biology is, is the main culprit yep. because the other side of really um, tackling our greenhouse gas footprint is the enteric emissions from cows. So cows have bad wraps, right, because they're releasing all this methane, releasing all this CO2. So first of all, what I always tell you know, people that I talk to and so forth, cows are not like cars, right? We're not digging up the carbon that they're releasing. You know, we're, we're grabbing the carbon out of the air, right, from the plants. You know, one acre of corn pulls in 18 tons of carbon dioxide in a, in a year. So that carbon dioxide is going into that plant, becoming carbon, obviously. We're feeding that to the, to the cattle. Now, they're digesting that, and they're releasing some back up in the air. And if they're just releasing CO2, it's a wash. You know, it, you're pulling CO2 out of the air, you release them up. The bad thing with cows is they release methane. Methane is 300 times worse as a greenhouse gas uh, and holding in heat than carbon dioxide. So what we're really looking into is a lot of different products to try to reduce the methane produced in that first ruminant in the cattle in order to get a, a, you know, a better climate smart footprint, if you will. And you know, there's a long list of products that are out there. I was lucky enough to go to a conference at UC Davis in May and uh, you know, there's Bovair, which is a drug by Eli Lilly, which is you know, reducing the methane by 30%. The bad thing is it's a drug, and we've, gonna, we've got to promise to our customers that we're not going to feed drugs to our cattle. So we've decided you know, we're not going to do that. Uh, there are other things, such as the red seaweed, that uh, you know, it's been out there in a lot of the literature. Uh, we're working with a company in Australia to do some tests, hopefully next year, uh, if we can get FDA approval and so forth to be testing that in our barns. These barns I mentioned, through our project, we're gonna be setting up lasers that go over the top of the cattle to measure how much methane is in the air. Uh, we're also gonna be setting up just regular methane sensors. We're gonna do ammonia sensors, carbon dioxide sensors in the air above the cattle, above each pen of cattle, with our goal then being able to split the barns and you know feed two pens of cattle with an additive and feed two pens without. And, and to see the difference. And, and again, we're not gonna do university level research. I'd really like to see places like UC Davis continue to do research on these different products to figure out you know, which one can really reduce methane. And one of the issues though is the delivery of the product. So Bovair has been available in Europe for I think about a year or so, and so they did some studies on it to where, in the, I know a study was in the Netherlands where they showed after two and a half hours the impact of Bovair goes away to where your, the cow is now producing as much methane as it did before you fed it. And so with that, you know, you think of a cow out grazing. You know, how possibly can you feed that cow or get that cow Bovair every two and a half hours? You know, there's talk about putting in molasses tubs and that kind of stuff. But any of those, even the seaweed product, you know, unless you're feeding that cattle a TMR, which, you know, works for the feedlots, works for dairy cows, but 80% of our farm methane is produced by the mama cow out on pasture with the calf, not by our calves out grazing, not by the calves in our finishing barns. So you know, any kind of TMR work we do is really only focused on that 20%, not the 80%. So lately, and again, I learned this from Dr. Christine Jones, is fenugreek is a product that we're looking into. Uh, it's supposed to have some capabilities to reduce methane. So uh, we found a source to, for the grain to where we can use that in our mineral supplements. 
Uh, everything I've read is it's a very small amount that you have to feed. So you're actually feeding the fenugreek seed itself. Exactly. You have to grind it, uh, but if you grind it a little bit, it, it's supposed to, uh, again, have that same properties of reducing the methogens in that ruminant. So we're going to try that, but again, grinding it and putting it in a TMR only solves that 20% issue. For the 80%, we're going to look at planting fenugreek in our pastures. Exactly. So we planted 10 acres of a, of a fenugreek oats mix uh, just about three weeks ago, and we're going to harvest that. We thought different ways on it. I think what we're going to do is dry it like hay and then chop it with our chopper to where then we can store it in a barn and just feed you know, 100, 200 pounds at a time in a mix and see what kind of impact. We're going to test that again in our TMR mix in our barns, but that would be a product then that we could take out to the pasture to try to help solve the 80% methane issue, which is obviously you know, the big chunk of it. What proportion of your pastures are annuals versus perennials? For our mama cows, uh, it's, it's probably 95% is perennials. And it's, in this area, it's a lot of fescue, orchard grass, clover, those kind of things. Would it not work to plant fenugreek into the pasture? Yes, yes, that, that's what we're going to try. Yep. That, that's our goal. If we can get to show that fenugreek as a plant reduces the methane, we're going to try that in our barns and our TMR, then the plan is to plant that. My understanding is it won't overwinter in our area, but we'll be able to plant that in the spring. And, uh, and, and try to get that as a higher percentage of our pastures. It's my understanding, and this is just from skimming headlines here and there, because this is one of many areas that I really would like to dive deeper into the research, but it just hasn't been the bandwidth for that yet or hasn't been a priority yet. It's my understanding that you have very different levels of methane production from cattle that are grazing versus cattle that are consuming a high corn diet. And obviously the, the corn, the distiller's grains, that your cattle are consuming are significantly smaller than, uh, than what would be mainstream production practices, but they're still not zero. Right. Is it accurate to, to compare the cattle grazing on pasture, the mama cows out on pasture, with what is happening in the feedlot? Is it possible that those might t- produce two very different levels of methane? They very well could. And I'm, I'm hoping, I said, some of these universities will be able to do the research. They've got like the green feed setups and so forth to where cattle will come to those. And they've got the, the tools and techniques to really analyze it on pasture. But yeah, I, what was fascinating to me is the more roughage in the diet, the more methane. It's really the, the rule. So, you know, the grass finished cattle, the cows that are out on really dry, rough ground are the ones that are going to produce the most methane which is opposite of what everyone would think going into it, right? You see the pictures of these nasty feedlots and, you know, 150,000 head and so forth in a small area. They're producing methane, but not as much as the cattle that are out roaming South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, and so forth, you know, it's big wide open pastures and so forth. So, yeah, it's definitely an issue for, you know, for those mama cows. The, The other fascinating thing I learned in this conference is 80% 80% of the overall cattle methane production is in developing countries. And you can visualize, you know, the peasant farmers in India that have, you know, one or two cows and so forth, very roughage, not improved uh, genetics. And, uh, you know, not, you know, they're eating a lot of roughage to produce a little bit of uh, amount of meat. So, again, 80% of the methane production from cattle coming from developing countries. So. At some point, we have to address that as well. It's interesting that fenugreek is a lot more popular in India and in Australia yeah. and so forth. I, I don't know how much on you know cattle utilize it, but it, it's kind of interesting. I got fenugreek in my house now. We we bought the tea and so forth, and every time I open it up or drink some of the tea, it smells like an Indian restaurant. Yeah. And uh, from my software days, I've got a lot of friends that are Indians and so forth. So uh, we've had some discussions on that, uh, that smell and those herbs that, that they've used for so long for, for their own health. You know, fenugreek is something that people have used for medicinal purposes as well. I find this whole conversation quite interesting because what is fenugreek's action? What does it do? Well, we could, we could frame that a couple of different ways. We could just very simplistically and generally say, is, well, it alters the gut microbiome. And the follow-up question to that is, well, what are the mechanisms for that and how does it do that? And that it contains 
specific compounds that shut down specific groups of microorganisms and or perhaps enhance others. And I'm sure I'm just riffing here. I've skimmed some research, but I haven't read it in quite a while. Uh, some of the more recent research on this. And there's not a lot out there on fenugreek. There's more on the red seaweed. But yep. I found some research on the fenugreek, but not, not a lot. But I'm reasonably confident in natural ecosystems, there are very few instances where nature restricts certain modes of action or certain ideas to a few species. And uh, when we have these diverse pasture systems where we have dozens or hundreds of perennials, uh, my question would be, what are other plants that we haven't yet identified that could offer similar benefits that might be much better fit for some of our more northern ecosystems than fenugreek? I'm sure they are out there. We just need to figure out what they are. I totally agree. And I think one of the issues with plants like fenugreek and so forth is who's going to do the research. You know, yeah, for these other exactly. products, there's a, there's a big lot of money to be made by Eli Lilly and so forth for producing a drug. No one's going to make much money on fenugreek because it's a commodity out there. And, right. and the other ones as well. So we really rely on universities that are doing research from government-funded research. That's the other thing is the USDA, someone like that, has to really fund this research. It's not going to come from the private industry. Well, Dave, this has been such an enjoyable and fascinating conversation. I thank you for being willing to share your insights. I'm sure that many people are going to find them very intriguing. What final thoughts or pieces of advice do you have for people who are listening? I guess probably the biggest thing is, you know, I would imagine a lot of folks are interested in, you know, how we've developed our market and, you know, what they're interested in, you know, and, and how to do that. And to me, it comes down to have a clear sense of what you're trying to achieve, you know, what your end goal is. But then also take a deep, hard look at your resources, you know, a, as you started the conversation with is, you know, what skills do you have? What amount of time do you have? And in our case, you know, our, it really worked out well for our family. Uh, you know, I, I had more of the supply chain background plus some sales background. My wife, with her attention to detail and just operations and her ability to memorize all the different customers and those kind of things, those were some key resources that we had, as well as a local butcher shop and local family that had just started. You know, we have talked to other butcher shops, and they've been in business for 100 years, and they're set in their ways, and they're not going to change things where our local processor was very amenable to, to adapt to what we were trying to do. And then when we brought our son back into the business uh, five years ago, you know, he had really good skill set as well. Uh, he had worked as a consultant in the healthcare industry for a while. So he's got you know, an MBA and really good knowledge on, on the business side of things. So anyways, those resources and, and what you've got available and what you're willing to invest in it is really critical. You know, this is not something that will be very successful as a part-time, you know, operation. That's kind of my, my, my ending thoughts on it anyways. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for being here for all the great work that you're doing and for being willing to share freely and to all of our listeners. I'll include a link to Dave's website in our show notes, which you can find on your podcast apps or on the regenerative agriculture podcast.com. Thank you, Dave. Have a happy growing season. All right. Thank you very much, John. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data, knowledge and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening and we look forward to working with you.